The Democracy Forum is a not-for-profit organization founded in 2009 under the patronage of Baroness Nicholson of Winterbourne. Its principal goal was to work for the furtherance of democracy, peace and the rule of law in order to counter religious fundamentalism and intolerance in our global communities. In an increasingly fractured world, this goal continues to be the driving force behind all of the Forum's activities. Lord Charles Bruce is the current president of the Forum. Since its inception, the Forum has hosted and co-hosted seminars on a wide variety of topics relating to democracy and human rights across the world. The Democracy Forum encourages academics, students, journalists and other socially and politically conscious people to attend our seminars and to participate in the question and answer session. Details are available on our website, thedemocracyforumlimited.com. In March 1971, a bloody nine-month liberation war began. It culminated in the creation of Bangladesh, whose status as an independent nation was recognized on the 16th of December that year. To mark this 15th anniversary of Bangladesh's independence, the Democracy Forum will host a webinar charting the country's journey from a liberation war to Asian success story. Please join us in this 50th anniversary year to celebrate, comment and bring your questions for the panel. Hello and welcome everybody, wherever you are in the world, to this month's Democracy Forum debate. Bangladesh, then and now, from liberation war to nucleus of South Asia. Now, from mainstream Western news outlets, we hear little about Bangladesh outside of natural disasters, climate change, garment factories, and giving sanctuary to the fleeing Rohingya refugees from Myanmar. But this is a country of more than 160 million people which in its 1971 War of Independence was also pivotal in reshaping the Cold War alignments. And now I'm fascinated, as I hope you are, to learn about its journey to become the nucleus of South Asia from an incredible panel. And the Democracy Forum is privileged to have with us the Bangladesh High Commissioner, Her Excellency Miss Saida Munatazneem. Following her will be Raman Sobham, Saeed Badral Assam, MJ Akbar, and David Lewis. Summing up at the end from the heart of Britain's parliamentary democracy will be Barry Gardner, MP, chair of the Democracy Forum, who keeps an eagle eye on Asia and the Indo-Pacific. He will join the dots for us. And first we go to Democracy Forum president, Lord Charles Bruce, who with his customary concise insight will set out the context and canvas of our debate. Lord Bruce, the screen is yours. On behalf of the Democracy Forum, I would like to welcome you all to the webinar which we're hosting this afternoon as our tribute to the 50th anniversary of the independence of Bangladesh. I would like to thank the team of TDF for organizing the proceedings today and for ensuring that you're able to view the broad panorama of momentous events which have determined the development of Bangladesh as an independent republic over the past half century. We're particularly fortunate to have been able to convince such an erudite group of contributors to join our panel today. And it's not often that we're able to draw on the living memory of historical actors who have participated in the critical moments of their nation's evolution. Uh, grateful thanks, as always, to Humphrey Hawksley, 
for agreeing to act as moderator. Our topic has been carefully chosen today to expand on the idea that Bangladesh should be granted a special status in South Asia, primarily because it is a state which emerged from the depths of a particularly bloody conflict and which was established with a constitution based on a clear and unambiguous set of principles, which had formed in the mind of a remarkable man, Bangabandhu, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. Indeed, the story of Bangladesh's birth pangs during the tumultuous year of war with Pakistan, which I'm sure will be recounted by our panelists today, is made more extraordinary by the fact that within a year of the declaration of a new state in 1971, such a conscionable and principled constitution should have emerged, built upon the four pillars of nationalism, secularism, democracy, and socialism, where independence and liberation advanced together hand in hand. Of the four pillars, it's perhaps secularism which is the most problematic today, not because of the specific circumstances of Bangladesh, but because of the deliberate erosion of secular democracy that has become such a destructive and divisive weapon in the armory of state suppression currently deployed by several countries in South Asia, which feature regularly in our webinars. In a lecture given earlier this year at the London School of Economics to commemorate Bangladesh's milestone anniversary, the Nobel laureate Amatya Sen spoke movingly of Sheikh Mujibur's vision for his country and emphasized the golden thread of equity and the freedom to coexist, which links each of the four pillars of the constitution. Indeed, it is Amatya Sen's view that the constitutional principle which the Sheikh entrusted to his country in 1972, in particular, the equal status given to religious practice and the exclusion of religion from politics, have descended intact and unbroken from the precepts of Emperor Akbar. And Amatya Sen notes that in his campaign speeches for the 1970 general elections, Mojibur did not hesitate to place the issue of equity between the different religious communities in front of the heterogeneous voting public. Commenting on this aspect of perennial idealism for the future existence of her country, the historian Ranak Jahan reminds us that although the guiding principles that lie behind the constitution undoubtedly provide a framework for good governance, they also reflect the essential humanity of Bangabandhu, who confided to his diary two years before he was assassinated. As a man, what concerns mankind concerns me. This abiding involvement is born of and nourished by love, enduring love, which gives meaning to my politics and to my very being. Perhaps it is this aspect of Bangladesh's destiny which sets a very high bar for the exercise of a state's responsibility to its citizens and to humanity. I hope that Bangabandhu's vision will stand undiminished as a moral and intellectual nucleus for South Asia for all time. Well, welcome to the webinar and please feel free to pass on your comments to our panelists, who I'm sure will be delighted to answer them for you. Lord Charles Bruce, thank you for that. A state which emerged from the depths of a horrendous bloody conflict, but established a constitution based on clear and unambiguous set of principles, which we will be uh, debating uh, in the uh, time coming up. Uh, as uh, Lord Bruce said, please send in your questions, challenge us, change our mindsets, make us think, make the audience think, and we will feed it into the debate. Uh, the High Commissioner 
for Bangladesh was due to join us now, but apparently they are having internet problems at the High Commission in London. Uh, so we are hoping that we will get her uh, in due course. But if I could first bring us to open the debate to Professor Raman Sobom, who is <clears throat> going to talk to us about Bangladesh's development journey, transformation and challenges. Now, Professor Sobom is chair of Center for Policy Dialogue. He has connections and fellowships and a huge list of contacts at Oxford, Columbia, Harvard, and in the early 1990s was a member of the Advisory Council on the Caretaker Government that stepped in after the overthrow of President Hussein Mohammed Ershad, which finally set Bangladesh on beginning on its current political path. And it was a story that I covered a lot for the BBC when I was based in Delhi. So, Professor Sobom, the screen is yours. Thank you. A great pleasure to be here. Uh, to, I think, uh, begin my narrative, I was uh, quite actively involved in the liberation struggle and, in fact, have recently published the second volume of my memoirs of my days in the government of Sheikh Mujib uh, when we were attempting to create a nation state uh, virtually out of the ashes of a liberation war. Uh, and if I can point out that what I propose to do today is to identify perhaps 10 significant elements of the um, transformational nature of the journey from the time that we initiated the nation building process uh, in at the beginning of 1972. And then I will round up my presentation because we have a very short time uh, to point out a few of the challenges, which in fact relate to what Lord Bruce has identified as the founding pillars of our constitution. Now, to begin with, I think the most uh, dramatic part of the story was the first three or four years when we actually constructed a nation state. Uh, I can't elaborate on that. Uh, too much effort will be going into it, but it was a state which had been devastated by war, which had been hollowed out by the migration of an entire imperial class who were mostly non-Bengalis who ran away to Pakistan at the time of liberation. And we had to both construct a state and to revive an economy in that period. And this whole process was, of course, interrupted at a very crucial stage by the assassination of Bongabundu, his family, and his close colleagues. So the story will be taken up after that by Badrul Esad, who will be covering what he terms as the dark ages, in which I hope he will also say something more about the element of um, secularism and its uh, trajectory from that period on to the present. What I will do is to take up the narrative from there and to largely look at where we have in fact reached today in terms of the development transformation. Now, the most remarkable feature has been the rediscovery of a huge capacity for entrepreneurship in the people of Bangladesh, which was in fact liberated by the emergence of an independent nation state. Some of the features of this transformation are to be seen in the agrarian transformation, where over a period of a half century, we have quadrupled agricultural production. We have transformed ourselves from a monsoon agriculture to an irrigated agriculture, which has ensured much greater stability. We have diversified our crops. We have diversified into uh, secondary products in agriculture and poultry livestock. And we have now got a thriving uh, non-agricultural economy, which in fact contributes even more to GDP than agriculture. <clears throat> so one of the features behind the rapid reduction in poverty in Bangladesh has been the dynamic of agriculture mostly led by small peasants uh, farming one to five acres of land at most, and mostly averaging around two to two and a half acres. <coughs> now, the next feature I talk about is 
the entrepreneurial revolution. At the time of liberation, we had no entrepreneurial class. The dynamic was really provided by a state and the state had to take on the major responsibility. But over the years, virtually out of nothing, but through massive state initial sponsorship with many elements of a negative downside, we did have the emergence of an entrepreneurial class. This has eventually uh, given us <coughs> the second largest garment exporting industry in the world after China in this period of time. Uh, this has also led to great backward linkage in the industry, diversification now of the economy. Bangladesh, in fact, which had one steel mill producing 100,000 tons of steel, now produces about 8 million tons of steel, which was quite beyond our imagination at the time of liberation. And we also now have a very dynamic, small, medium, uh, and uh, micro industrial sector emerging. <laughs> the next significant contribution has come from what we call our working women. Uh, this again has been another revolutionary transformation. Part of this has come from the microcredit revolution, which has enabled uh, something like about 30 million uh, women to avail of credit and to in fact become gainful contributors to the economy, operating at the micro level, many from their own homesteads. Uh, we've had a significant educational transformation where today uh, virtually everyone is in primary school, a large number are at secondary school. And in both primary and secondary education, women, girls outnumber boys, which is one of the remarkable achievements. Women wage earners have been another revolutionary transformation. Uh, poor women, mostly operating in the seclusion of their home, have now come out of their home and are now living in our urban sector and our wage workers, about 4 million of them are working in the garment industry and provide as much of a dynamic to the industry as the garment entrepreneurs. The fifth element is our migrants. <clears throat> this again has been quite remarkable. People risk life and limb now to go to any part of the world which they think provides an opportunity. Uh, this was a country where once upon a time to go from your village to the nearest district town was a great adventure. Now virtually every young person in Bangladesh refuses to recognize their village as their natural economic boundary and sees the world as their economic boundary. Whilst India has gone through periods of uh, slight hysteria about Bangladeshis migrating to India, we now tend to bypass India and have gone all over the world because we look to the more dynamic sectors of the world <coughs> and go there. The next has been the human resource development transformation, the spread of education, the universalization of immunization, and which has now given us uh, uh, health indicators, including uh, longevity, including uh, the different elements of healthcare, where our numbers are rather more favorable even than India's today. And the seventh has been the NGO evolution. Uh, David Lewis is an expert on that and may say more about that. What has been significant about that is that uh, we have not only uh, helped to reduce poverty, we have brought in a whole generation of educated young people from the urban sector to come and work in the rural areas. And in the process, we have then uh, empowered and energized the whole large constituency in areas from sort of microfinance to health education. And many of the improved indicators in human development originate in the NGO revolution. We've had two pioneers in Yunus, a Nobel Prize winner who has set up the largest microfinance institution in the world, and Abid, who in fact has uh, set up what is now recognized as the largest NGO, corporate NGO in the world. The next one has been the uh, ICT revolution, the most recent one, and that too is a uh, development which is ongoing 
and which in fact is holds out great promise for the future. We probably now have a much higher coverage of uh, uh, IT phones even than India today. Uh, infrastructure transformation, where the government has played a leading role, has been very helpful. We are now, uh, in fact, generating energy surplus to our needs when we were running a huge deficit a short while ago. Our transport infrastructure has also been significantly developed. And of course, the end result of all this has been that we have now been in the last uh, decade operating at the level of 7 to 8% rates of growth, which are one of the highest in the world. Uh, we have significantly reduced poverty. We have got improved human development indicators. And it has now graduated us out of the ghetto of the LDCs and have taken us on to the next stage. <clears throat> we legitimately aspire to evolve into a upper middle income country. Now, let me round this up very shortly. Uh, I do I hope I have a few minutes uh, to talk about the challenges. Every upward trajectory has, of course, also its challenges, which need to address some of the downside. Our entrepreneurial re revolution has, of course, had many negative features. <laughs> State-sponsored entrepreneurship has led to massive injections of state resources, including credit, which has led to, in many cases, large-scale default due to uh, weak regulatory interventions, uh, again, due to uh, malfunction in the way in which the relations of the state to the market have, in fact, tended to operate. Our uh, democratic journey has been uneven. We have been through episodes of cantonment rule. When, in fact, democracy was restored, we had to operate with a dysfunctional parliament where it was boycotted for large periods of time by the opposition, leading then to an unaccountable government and the dominance of the executive in our governance process. Uh, it was a very in exclusionary democracy with money and muscle power playing an important role and leading to state capture now by people with large resources so that representation in parliament is in fact now got hardly any presence of an opposition and in fact is mostly occupied by people categorizing themselves as businessmen. Uh, people with modest means, working class people, people from the lower middle class, the same category of people uh, such as Bongo Bondu, who in fact drove the democratic uh, transformation of the struggle over here and came from modest backgrounds, could not expect to in fact now get into our parliament today because of the exclusionary nature of that. Political parties have also uh, gone through a process in which uh, absence of democracy within the party has again led to uh, a disconnect between party and people, uh, which in fact has led to political parties now being motivated more by material expectations rather than a commitment to a public purpose. Uh, this has, of course, also led to weak and politicized governance. Uh, law enforcement itself has also become politicized so that uh, those who have the protection of the state are likely to, in fact, uh, improve their prospects, those who do not face problems. Justice has often tended to be one-eyed, where, in fact, much depends on who you are and what your connections and resources are. And this, of course, has all led to problems of a crisis in governance leading to a partisan bureaucracy, lack of transparency and accountability. Those of you who have been reading your newspapers uh, have seen the picture of this brave journalist, in fact, uh, peering through the bars of a police van who was trying to do her duty by, in fact, doing some investigative journalism that has ended up uh, uh, behind bars because of that. Now, this, of course, has led to uh, erosion of the autonomy of the media. And, of course, 
lack of accountability has contributed again to corruption. Uh, all this has had an impact on our development transition because it has raised the cost of doing business. It has led to, in fact, uh, high cost development projects, delays in implementation, and a disincentive for the incoming FDI compared to countries such as Vietnam. So if we want to make the transition, we will have to address some of these challenges. Climate change is an important factor. Uh, we are doing a great deal. The government is to be commended in that direction. But at the same time, market forces and unregulated uh, uh, business sector have in fact been abusing the environment for financial gain. All this has led to a much more inegalitarian society which of course has been uh, one of the main challenges and a di diversion from a key element of Bongo Bandhu's vision and element of the constitution, which was centered on the construction of a more egalitarian society. We've now become a much more elite driven society. In fact, leading partially to elite capture of the state. Uh, <coughs> we need to provide a much more incentivized structure for in fact bringing into play both in participation in the political process and participation in the full benefits of our uh, high rates of growth for a large number of the working people who have in fact provided the dynamic of our development and success. All these I now say and I conclude by pointing out that because of our of our high growth because of the resources which have been accumulated and because we are now much more self-reliant than we used to be, the opportunities for addressing these challenges are much more, uh, are much brighter and stronger than they were when we in fact began this journey with virtually nothing in our coffers in a devastated economy. How effectively we deal with this will depend on how rapidly we can restore the democratic traditions, which in fact drove the liberation struggle and were so central to the founding pillars of the state. Here, we look to the leadership of our prime minister as the heir of Bongo Bandhu to in fact uh, use the opportunities that she has already created to in fact regenerate the democratic process and to move us towards a more egalitarian society than we have achieved. So even though we have reduced poverty, unless we address the problems of democratizing both economic and political opportunity, this will be a challenge which will in fact have more serious consequences for realizing our more ambitious development goals. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raymond Soban, uh, for that. Um, I just wanted to, before we move on, I wanted to ask you, one point going taking your mind back to when you were a liberation activist you've just given us a very detailed account of what's been achieved and the challenges with of course the knowledge of a whole career <coughs> your distinguished career when you were a young activist what would you say is the biggest element that's taken you by surprise and what did you imagine bangladesh would become as an independent nation well, I would say certainly that the biggest surprise would be the liberation of our entrepreneurial spirit, because essentially it has enabled us to move from a much more state centric system to a more market driven system. But of course, at the same time, we had expected that this would be, again, a much more democratized system, both economically and politically. And uh, the Disappointment has been that we have not been able to, in fact, establish that process. But that is, the economic transformation has been, uh, in many cases, quite miraculous. And no one could imagine that uh, a country which began under such adverse circumstances could have reached the levels that we have reached today. So, so, so it, it essentially, the, the pleasant surprise is the economic transformation, the entrepreneurship, and the disappointment has been the level of, 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 of democracy and, and the democratic institutions, which brings me uh, beautifully on to Saeed Badrul 
Arsan, who's a veteran journalist, political commentator, author of many books, including From Rebel to Founding Father, Sheikh Mujibi Rahman, was published in 2013. Uh, Saeed contributes to a string of mainstream newspapers. I won't mention them all because the list goes on here, but he is a voice to be reckoned with. And he's going to be talking to us about Bangladesh's dark ages, the counter-revolutions, 1975 to 96, and then 2001 to 06. Saeed, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hawksley, and thank you, Lord Bruce, and uh, greetings to all my fellow panelists here. Uh, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the day that uh, Bangladesh achieved independence, was liberated on December 16, 1971. The government, uh, which had organized and uh, administered uh, the war of liberation, it, that government decreed that four political parties, the Pakistan Democratic Party, the Nizami Islam, the Jamaat Islami, and the Muslim League would, uh, would be banned. The reasons were two. Firstly, Bangladesh would be a secular state where religion or religious politics would have no place. And secondly, these four political parties had actively collaborated with the Pakistan army in, throughout 1971. Now, moving on from there, in 1975, August 15, 1975, the father of the nation, Bongo Bandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, was assassinated with most members of his family. And within a month of his assassination, I, call it, I, I, I refer to the, the spirit as, as uh, the period, period of the counter revolution at the Dark Age, because of all the, of the darkness that we went through. We are celebrating, we are observing the 50th anniversary of the country's independence, but this period is also one that should be remembered, that should be recalled by every generation of Bengalis and indeed by historians everywhere. So within a month of Bongo Bandhu's assassination on the 15th of August, 1975, the regime that took over, say that, that took over, and the regime was uh, curiously led by his political colleague, his Commerce Minister Khundukar Mushtaq Ahmed, who was helped uh, in the coup by a, a group of majors and lieutenant colonels. That regime decreed in September 1975, slightly more than a month after, after the assassination, that there would be an indemnity ordinance which would protect the, the assassins of the, of the father of the nation. But that is something which is unheard of. First of all, uh, these assassins succeeded in killing uh, Sheikh Mujib and in overturning his government. And then you have this law coming in, this, this uh, law promulgated called the Indemnity Ordinance. So that was in September 1975. This uh, uh, Indemnity Ordinance was given constitutional sanction in 1979, when in February 1979, a parliament which was uh, elected during the time of the, of the country's first military dictator, uh, General Zia Rahman, that parliament decreed a fifth amendment to the constitution and the indemnity ordinance was incorporated as part of that, of that amendment. This is one aspect uh, of, of uh, the first steps toward darkness that we that the country took. Then amazingly, a good number of these assassins were sent off outside Bangladesh, uh, sent off uh, to different countries. One went to Japan, some went to Africa, some went to Pakistan as diplomats. So this is again another, this was again another shock for us, indeed for civilized people everywhere. These assassins became diplomats, they served as diplomats, and the surprising thing is the, the countries to which they were sent as diplomats, they never inquired about their background, or perhaps they knew, even so they accepted these people as uh, uh, diplomats. At, at a certain point, uh, these diplomats, some of these, dipl uh, uh, these, some of these assassins, they formed a political party. The, the leader, uh, the, the leader of the coup, Colonel Farooq Rahman, he formed a political party during the, the era of General Irshad, and he called it the Freedom Party. And he even took part in the presidential election in 1988. He lost the election, of course. But then, this, you see, this is scandalous. This was scandalous behavior on the part of the powers that that were at the time, and. Another member of the Freedom Party, he eventually succeeded in becoming a member of parliament during the, uh, the period of the, uh, the second government, uh, of the government of uh, General Zia's widow, Khalid Zia. So 
you have these this indemnity auditor you have the fifth amendment you have these assassins becoming diplomats uh, becoming forming a political party and free parliament now the other point about da, da, our dark ages we began as a democratic as a secular democratic bengali nationalistic uh, country in 1971 and we our political leaders from bangabandhu uh, uh, to all the others their struggle for for 25 years be uh, for the 24 years in fact from 1947 to 1971 was always for a democratic form of government in pakistan so when bangladesh came into existence the idea uh, the idea was that there would always be a democracy there would always there would be parliamentary democracy and there would be uh, uh, there, there would be regular elections uh, through which people could uh, choose their uh, representatives but ironically after 1975 between 1975 and 1982 we had two military rulers the two military rulers who imposed martial law on the country general zia ur rahman who was there from november 1975 to his up to his assassination in may 1981 and then from march 1982 to december 1980 the second military ruler general hussein mohammad ershad so we have had these two dictators they have both seizing power through undemocratic means but in that period during that that, that stage of our history there were 19 abortive coups against general zia and in the process again a whole lot of military officers most of them who had fought in the liberation war who had organized the mukti bahini or the liberation army they died they were killed they, one after the other hundreds of soldiers were were murdered on charges which are which were trumped up and uh, senior officers uh, uh, they were they were killed uh, in, in, in their own in fighting so this happened this went on till september 19 uh, 1981 when 13 military officers were hanged after a, a trial which uh, keeps raising questions after secret trial and they were uh, they were they were hanged on charges of being behind the assassination of general zia Zia was, was a freedom fighter. These officers were also freedom fighters, but we still don't know what led to their uh, their assassination. Another freedom fighter, Colonel Sahir, he was also subjected to a secret trial in July 1976 by General Zia. He he had been an associate of General Zia in uh, in 1975. He too uh, went through a secret trial and he was hanged. This uh, this is uh, one aspect. Then there the The, the rise of communal uh, politics in the country. You see, uh, from fifteenth August nineteen seventy-five, we are gradually going down the path of non-secular uh, politics. Uh, because on on the day before fifteenth uh, August nineteen seventy-five, every day Radio Bangladesh in Bengali we call it Bang- Bangladesh Betar or Radio Bangladesh. It started its transmission with readings from four religious books: the Quran, the Bible, the Tripitaka of the Buddhists. and the ramayana of of uh, of the hindu religion on the 15th of august everything changed and they started reading only from the quran and islamic uh, salutations uh, began to be drilled into our uh, our uh, consciousness so these these uh, apart from these this uh, dictatorship this dictatorial rule what they also what they did was in in december 1975 the regime of general zia it repealed the collaborators ordinance the, the collaborators ordinance had come into existence in, uh, in 1972 and uh, at one point sheikh mujibur rahman's government uh, in a in general in a, in a move of general clemency it pardoned some collaborators those who had not been actively involved in murder and rape and pillage but 11000 collaborators were still in prison but then the removal of the collaborators ordinance uh, in december 1975 it allowed these collaborators to go free surprisingly again something we don't expect we haven't seen anything like this in in countries in, in, in like germany or in, in japan we have not had the spectacle of nazis coming back to power or the japanese military coming back to power but in bangladesh the very communal forces bengali uh, religious communal forces which had collaborated with the pakistan occupation army they were given a free reign the uh, uh, politics was desecularized and the jamaat-e-islami the muslim league and all the other religious religious based political parties 
they came back and a, a good number of them ended up being ministers in the in the regimes of general zia general isha and khalid zia so this this was again another people who were actively opposed to bangladesh and uh, who were on, on the record and uh, who's uh, uh, there there's testimony to to their role in history that that has was ignored how these people became uh, persons people who actually who actively fought in december uh, towards the end of december 1971 that bangladesh quote and unquote would be an illegitimate child of india they happily became ministers in, in bangladesh so of course uh, the good thing is later on uh, uh, sheikh hasina's government they uh, they were tried let's see and they were tried and a whole lot of them a good number of them uh, went to the gallows not that we are happy about their going to the gallows but the fact is these people should have been punished should have should have paid uh, should, should have had the compensation that didn't happen now so then again i as uh, uh, for coming to the end uh, i would like to say here that the history that we were uh, treated to between 1975 and 1996 uh, uh, 21 years that was sanitized history earlier till 1975 till august 1970 oh yeah there's one other point in 1975 again november 4th the four main personalities political leaders behind the mujib nagar government of 1971 they had been they, they were murdered assassin, assassinated in in the so called secure confinement of dhaka central jail so that's another blot on our history so after in, in these 21 years uh, we were treated to sanitize history uh, every year when we celebrated victory day or victory day on december 16 or independence day on on march 26 uh, prior to november 1970 uh, uh, prior to the, uh, august 1975 we always made it a uh, made it a point to mention that the, there was a war which the bengali nation waged against the pakistan occupation army after august 1975 new, newspapers media and radio and television uh, on strict instruction for the regime they carefully left out the world pakistan and they only mentioned occupation army you, you would have uh, you have the idea uh, you, you would get the idea that suddenly one fine morning the bengali nation woke up from sleep and waged war and uh, became independent sheikh mujibur rahman and all his uh, political colleagues they were were brushed out of history for 21 years we didn't hear sheikh mujib's name mentioned in any article in any commentary not on the radio not on television and uh, then again after uh, 1975 in the 21 years prior to uh, to 1975 there were cert- certain questions of diplomacy which the government was engaged in with the government of pakistan uh, essentially a sharing of the assets and liabilities of pre 1971 pakistan that question was dropped no government uh, between in those 21 years uh, mentioned it then again uh, the one of the biggest uh, points of damage very damaging to our country was the fact of bangladeshi nationalism being brought in now we were bengalis we are bengalis we went to war on the basis of bengali nationalism our entire democratic struggle uh, in the 24 years of pakistan was based on bengali nationalism but then the the, the military regime they came it came in with their own uh, sanitized version of nationalism they called it bangladeshi nationalism which essentially meant they removed secularism from the constitution they removed socialism from the constitution in place of secularism they they expressed their belief in allah and this step was carried a little forward again by the second military dictator general esha when he imposed islam as the as the religion of the state islam is the religion of the majority of course but but then what was happening here was a majoritarian religion was being imposed in the country that is not that that effectively made second classes of other uh, of other religious groups hindus christians buddhists and others and uh, finally they of uh, these uh, regimes they played very particular roles very active roles in breaking up political parties general zia he said money would be no problem but money was a problem and uh, 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 general ishad of course uh, he he was there he was the longest uh, surviving dictator in in uh, in bangladesh uh, uh, and he, uh, he uh, during his time 
it was a civil military bureaucratic complex that took over uh, the country. And uh, then again, finally, uh, the, the, while talking, I've, I've, I've just spoken about the period from 1975 to 1996. Uh, again, from 2001 to 2006, five years uh, of the government led by uh, uh, Begum uh, Khalid Azir, that again was uh, was a reversal of history. What Sheikh Hasina's government between 1996 and, and uh, 2001 had had achieved or was trying to achieve, that was again overturned by Khalid Azir's government in, uh, in the, where between 2001 and 2006. So that was the dark age. That was the period of counter-revolution. And so far, uh, we have had some, we have had problems, as uh, Professor Hamad Saban pointed out. We do have problems, and we do have a whole uh, a lot of mountain to climb. The impediments are still there, but then we are happy that we are finally on the road uh, back to our goals of uh, democracy, secularism, nationalism, and maybe perhaps socialism. In these days, when socialism is uh, no more the norm. I thank you. Saeed, thank you very much for that uh, enlightening um, but grim uh, account of the, the Dark Ages. There's two periods of Dark Ages uh, with, with Bangladesh. Now, I, I would come in with a question, but we are lucky enough to have with us now the High Commissioner uh, for Bangladesh in London, um, Her Excellency Saida Muna Tasneem, whose curriculum vitae, I have to say, had me on the edge of my seat as I went through it. Her diplomatic career has taken her through dealing with refugee crisis, money laundering, counter-terrorism, women's empowerment, and national defense. It's an incredible list. And now we have your country, High Commissioner, at the nucleus of South Asia. So without further ado, High Commissioner Tasneem, the screen is yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. Oxley. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. I, I do apologize to particularly all the uh, my co-panelists and to you and to the Democracy Forum, uh, particularly uh, Mr. Barry Gardner, MP, the chair. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, to my, um, you know, my guru, uh, <laughs> uh, Professor Iman Subhan. Uh, I couldn't be here to listen to him speak. I missed his, but I listened to a little bit to uh, my other um, senior friend and colleague, uh, Mr. Badru, Said Badrul Hassan, it was wonderful listening to the last bit of his speech uh, where he's promoting, you know, he was uh, reasserting the fundamental values of state policy of Bangladesh. So I want to thank everyone in the Democracy Forum for inviting me here. Uh, and uh, particularly given the fact that, you know, they are, I understand they are celebrating the 50th or golden uh, jubilee of the independence of Bangladesh. And uh, I uh, thank them for such a wonderful title, uh, Bangladesh Then and Now, from Liberation War to Nucleus of South Asia. Couldn't have been a more befitting title, uh, reflecting on our liberation war and the values uh, and why did Bangladesh emerge as a people's republic from an Islamic republic. Uh, and I think Said Badul Hassan is amply, very in detail reflected on that. But um, thank you, thanks to everyone for inviting me here. I think, uh, you know, uh, I would start with uh, the topic where it says from liberation war to nucleus of South Asia. In fact, you know, uh, the liberation war, uh, Said Badrul Hassan has mentioned that uh, why the liberation war explains. Now, sometimes what I see in the United Kingdom, you know, the fact that in 1947, uh, the British had left us uh, nicely, you know, in the, in the Ratcliffe line was drawn and we were left with, uh, on the basis of religion, with an Islamic Republic. In fact, the first Islamic Republic of the world and Pakistan was the first Republic because Iran came much later. And, um, the fact that, you know, the Bengali nationalism did not allow us, that there was this disruptive politics led by our father of the nation, Bongo the Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, uh, where, uh, you know, uh, the way the status quo was left in 1947, uh, there would be, uh, a, a, you know, Muslim-based Islamic Republic of Pakistan and, you know, India and uh, Bangladesh, the people of Bangladesh would, uh, uh, you know, even though geographically uh, and culturally very, very different, would coexist with uh, in such a system did not, um, you know, uh, eventually it, it didn't sustain, it was not tenable. And why, I think I said Bajrul Hassan has explained, and I'm sure Professor Iman Subhan reflected on it, uh, Bongo Bundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman's, uh, you know, struggle and leadership uh, for this 23 uh, years, uh, whereby in 1970, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the 
1952, the language movement transformed into a six-point demand for self-determination. There were economic, political, cultural, and other discriminations. And based on that, and suppression and oppression, and then 1970 general elections and democratic power was not handed over to uh, the Bengalis. Basically, uh, it was impossible to think that a Bengali leader would become the prime minister of Pakistan. That was the main reason. Now, uh, if we look at in 1971, our, uh, you know, our liberation war, uh, through the liberation war, actually at that time also Bangladesh was, uh, you know, without realizing quite at the epicenter of South Asia. Now today you're saying we're the nucleus of South Asia, but what happened in 1971? The, the US uh, President Nixon in, 19, in December 1971, it, you know, the uh, US uh, Seven Fleet Task Force 74 was proceeding towards uh, uh, towards the Bay of Bengal in December 1971. And at the same time, the Russia dispatched a nuclear armed flotilla from Vladivostok in December 13, 1971, under command of Admiral uh, Krukyakov, the commander of the 10th operative battle group, the Pacific Fleet, it was called. Um, quite often we hear 1971 was an India-Pakistan war. Why is that? Because even in 1971, uh, you know, Bangladesh emerged, the very emergence of Bangladesh, the creation of Bangladesh under the leadership of Bangladesh is uh, founding father, you know, a, a very uh, firebrand Bengali nationalist leader, uh, Bangladesh Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, was a disruption in the status quo. And, you know, the, the geopolitics had to uh, take over. It was actually, you know, many say that, you know, it was a war between uh, it was at the peak of Cold War, and uh, Bangladesh was born at the peak of Cold War, where U.S. had sent a fleet, Russia was sending a fleet. In the UN, UN Security Council, there were three times or two times there was this veto that was being planned by uh, China, you know, when, when it came to uh, sending a peacekeeping mission to Bangladesh to end the liberation war of Bangladesh. So there, you know, we have friends such as Russia. We had in 1971 friends such as Russia supporting us. India supporting us. And, you know, particularly, I know Mr. M.J. Akbar will be speaking here. So I'd like to particularly pay a tribute to, uh, you know, the um, armed forces of India and the Indian government, Shimati uh, Indira Gandhi, who had supported Bangladesh's war liberation and stood next to us. And also United Kingdom uh, and the Bengali British uh, diaspora here. And many, many uh, politicians in the 1970, uh, during 1971, who joined the Trafalgar Square demonstrations supporting the Bangladesh uh, a war of liberation, providing uh, moral, political, humanitarian support to our freedom fighters. So, um, and of course, in 1972, on 8th of January, when uh, Bangladesh Sheikh Mujibur Rahman was released from Pakistan jail, he uh, came here and Prime Minister Edward Heath uh, addressed him and sort of, it was a, uh, you know, de facto recognition of him as um, the president of Bangladesh. He was received very warmly. And in August 1971, uh, you know, in India in April, we had raised our flag. Uh, and uh, while the war was going on, and the second country where Bangladesh raised its flag and opened its diplomatic mission during the War of Liberation in August 1971 was the United Kingdom. So I think that these two countries are extremely, extremely politically uh, significant in our 1971 war and the uh, support that we had received. So from that perspective, in 1971, uh, 1971 Bangladesh emerged as a people's republic based on four fundamental uh, state principles, which uh, has already been mentioned, democracy, Bengali nationalism, secularism. And uh, uh, of course, uh, it was socialism at that time, and now it's social justice. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, uh, based on uh, why is it that you know, even Bangladesh Sheikh Mujib was encouraged by many Islamic leaders that why don't you create an Islamic Republic of Bangladesh? But he, he uh, declined that. And he said that uh, the very discrimination uh, that we had witnessed for 23 years is the basis and very uh, is the rationale as to why we need a secular, inclusive uh, country where a religion-based politics should not be allowed. And therefore, in 1972, we had a secular constitution. We were born as a, Isla uh, not as an Islamic republic, but we uh, were born as a people's republic. Uh, and uh, if you look at uh, in, in, in the last, uh, you know, 50 years of Bangladesh history, uh, I think Said Badrul Hassan reflected on it quite a bit, you know, the political history. But uh, from there, what I wanted to say is that even in 1971 war, Bangladesh war was, Bangladesh continued to be at the epicenter of, uh, you know, global geopolitics and regional geopolitics. But, uh, and, you know, again, it was the Bengali people who decided their fate and decided to disrupt the status quo um, and uh, come out as a third state in uh, in the post-colonial uh, South Asia, where, um, uh, you know, uh, in post-colonial South Asia, there were, it was decided there would be only two states, Pakistan and India. But there was this third state uh, and reality that emerged in 1971 war. Uh, and the strategic importance of Bangladesh has not 
you know, in 1971 was no less than it is today. Uh, the fact that today, uh, you know, Bangladesh is seen as the nucleus of South Asia, uh, it, we were still, as a Bengali nation, we're very much the nucleus of South Asia, even then. So I think that uh, from that perspective, we can reflect on how we have evolved as a nation and why uh, we, have, we have evolved to what we have today. Uh, I can reflect on that. Uh, as today's Bangladesh, you know, just yesterday, IMF had declared that Bangladesh's per capita income has exceeded, uh, is 2227, 2,227. Uh, and it has exceeded India's per capita last year. But what is important, you know, this kind of comparisons are quite uh, uh, unfair because, you know, Bangladesh is a small country. Our GDP definitely is growing. But what is important is if we do self-reflection in last 12 years, in one decade, Bangladesh's GDP has grown 190 percent. That means from 100 billion to 310 billion. And we are slotted to become the 23rd largest economy by 30, 20, 30, uh, 2035. And uh, uh, today, you know, uh, our, if you see during post-COVID, uh, our grow, uh, in post-COVID, we've had a record high foreign reserves. We've had a record high remittance. We've had a record high foreign investment pledge in 2020, uh, uh, about, uh, you know, uh, 3 billion. And it was top five countries in the world. We, uh, you know, this is, uh, uh, again, an IMF uh, study that says that apart from India, Brazil, Mexico, uh, China, Countries such as that, Bangladesh is the fifth country that has registered, uh, you know, uh, three billion and uh, one of the top five foreign investment pledges. Uh, and if you look at, uh, you know, Bangladesh UK relations as well, you know, in Prime Minister Boris Johnson's message on the 50th anniversary, uh, he says that Bangladesh uh, is one of the fastest growing economies in the world today. And uh, on the basis, uh, you know, and uh, UK looks forward to, uh, uh, you know, have more shared prosperity with Bangladesh under its global Britain policy. So uh, currently, you know, if you look at our economic indicators, uh, definitely it is the uh, fastest growing economy in, in, in South Asia. But geopolitically also, our importance is extremely, extremely high even now. As you know that, you know, um, uh, uh, John Kerry was in Bangladesh uh, and Alex Sharma will be visiting Bangladesh. Uh, uh, the thing that we are giving, we are a leader in climate change, uh, a current president of Climate Vulnerable Forum. Uh, so all these uh, leadership uh, that Bangladesh takes and the geopolitical importance of uh, how Bangladesh's foreign policy is slotted. Uh, currently, you know, we are asked that whether we're going to join the uh, Indo-Pacific Alliance or we're going to join the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative. But, you know, uh, we have always maintained a Bangladesh Sheikh Mujib's foreign policy, which is friendship to all and malice towards none. And, uh, you know, good neighborly relations and uh, a balanced foreign policy. So we continue to do that. So from every perspective, all rivers uh, flow to Blair Bengal. And at the end of the day, uh, we do have two very important neighbors who are geopolitically very important. Uh, one is India and the other one is Myanmar. And the fact that we host 1.1 million Rohingya refugees, uh, we are a climate leader. The fact that, you know, geopolitically, geoconnectivity wise, we are, we, do, we are a frontier state, the last frontier in South Asia where Southeast Asia or the ASEAN starts. So from geoeconomically, we are still, uh, uh, we continue to be, uh, if not the only nucleus, but an emerging and important nucleus in South Asia. This is all true. Uh, and at the same time today, Bangladesh's social indicators uh, also uh, are very impressive. And World Economic Forum keeps on, you know, repeating it every year that, you know, in women empowerment, uh, we are the seventh uh, global gender index, a gender gap index. We're the seventh uh, uh, politically empowered country uh, women empowerment perspective uh, in the world and within 100 and uh, you know um, 63 countries our position is 50 which is top in south asia when it comes to women empowerment at the same time when you look at the global counterterrorism index out of 163 countries bangladesh's position is 33 so we have in the global counterterrorism counter extremism index uh, that is one uh, of the pillars of bangladesh's uh, leadership right now uh, and coming back to why is Bangladesh doing so, uh, you know, uh, is emerging as, as this nucleus of South Asia. Actually, I would go beyond that. It's not only South Asia, it's Asia and globally. Uh, I think our leadership is uh, one of the key reasons is the leadership, our leadership of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, who is a very visionary leader. In 2009, when there was no digital economic vision of any South Asian country, she declared digital Bangladesh vision for Bangladesh. And today, as a result, we have, uh, you know, 99% mobile phone penetration. Uh, we have 60% internet penetration. Big names such as, you know, uh, Google, White Pro, Infosys, uh, uh, IBM, uh, YouTube, every big company is in Bangladesh. 
Dhaka Stock Exchange's 20% has been procured by Shanghai Stock Exchange. At the same time, you know, uh, our uh, Alipay and Alibaba and Gates Foundation has procured Bcash. It's a fintech company. Uh, so, you know, this kind of big names investments are coming into Bangladesh. So from that perspective, we must ask that why is Bangladesh doing so well? Number one is leadership. As I mentioned, that we have a leader who is U.S. Uh, foreign policy thinkers, top 10 thinker, for uh, uh, defense and security and counterterrorism. She is absolutely non-zero tolerance towards counterterrorism and uh, counter extremism. Uh, she is promoting women empowerment and she, is, she believes in our people. Our people's um, capacity and resilience, uh, you know, our skill, our people's skill to resilience. So in climate uh, and natural disaster leadership also, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina is uh, giving global leadership in Bangladesh, is a global leader in our natural disaster. So our people is, our, uh, number one is leadership, number two is our people. And if you look, our population is 65% young population. And uh, this is going to be a demographic dividend that Bangladesh will continue to enjoy until 2040 uh, and perhaps even beyond. Uh, so our hardworking people and resilient people, and of course, uh, uh, you know, our, our social fiscal policies. And we will continue to, our foreign policy is extremely important, I think plays a very important role. And of course, our civil society. And here, you know, today we have uh, Professor Rehman Subhan, uh, CPD, a very prominent organization and civil society organization. We have many more like that. And uh, also the fact that, you know, uh, democracy plays an important role in Bangladesh and will continue to play this democratic and pluralism and pluralist societies. These are very important values. Now, I would end with what, what kind of Bangladesh UK would like to see in next 50 years. In the next 50 years, we see that UK should uh, continue to support Bangladesh's secular and, uh, you know, inclusive um, and democratic values and, uh, you know, uh, 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 national character and uh, uh, you know the 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 regional uh, importance of bangladesh that means strategically uk uh, you know we have the fourth strategic dialogue between bangladesh and uk coming up on 1st of july and uh, we are trying to create more partnership in uh, in contemporary issues such as digital partnership climate partnership uh, and of course you know education partnership these are the areas that will continue to and skills and innovation partnership and definitely counterterrorism partnership so these are the areas where we encourage the UK government to look into Bangladesh, to continue to support its secular and inclusive nature, its democratic and pluralistic values, and at the same time, its economic uh, possibilities and potentials. And definitely its role in South Asia as, a, as the, as the uh, one could say nucleus, but I would say the key point of connectivity uh, and um, you know, geo-economic value of Bangladesh. Uh, and I th want to thank Democracy Forum one more time for giving us this giving me this opportunity. And I'd like to pay a special, um, uh, you know, uh, tribute to Professor Rehman Subhan and also Mr. M. G. Uh, you for joining us. Uh, because you know, uh, just uh, last 26th of March, for one week, Bangladesh celebrated 50th anniversary of our independence, where all South Asian leaders expressed solidarity with the third state in post-colonial uh, South Asia that is emergence of Bangladesh. And Prime Minister Modi was also there in, on 26th of March. And we especially thank the role of India and Bhutan, countries that had supported us during our 1971 war, during our, before we actually uh, uh, earned our victory uh, on 16th of December. So with those words, thank you very much. Thank you hey. uh, very much uh, for, for that uh, insight there. And now all of you audience out there, challenge what the High Commissioner said. She is the voice of the Bangladesh government. If you've got any questions, if you've got any challenges, uh, just let us know. Different arguments, different perspectives. That's what Democracy Forum debate is all about. And if I could, uh, High Commissioner, just ask you one question that's come in from YS Gill. Uh, how will your government curb the activities of fanatical groups which enjoy the patronage of foreign Islamists? If you could just give us it in a nutshell, a very quick answer of what the what, what your principles are in dealing with that issue. Thank you very much. I think uh, I have reflected in it already that, you know, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina uh, over the past decade had, you know, our, our counterterrorism index and global counterterrorism performance has only gone up and up, just like our human development index. And uh, it's, it's a non-compromising position on, on, on part of uh, our current leadership. Uh, uh, which uh, absolutely details the 1971 values. In 1971, also, uh, Bangladesh Sheikh Mujib's position was there will be no religion-based politics in Bangladesh, and the. Uh, just, 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 just,
2000. Yeah, but this is this is the mistake people make. You have to connect 1971 to now because the the ideological uh, uh, the ideological conflict continues. In 1971, it was an ideology. You know, there is the majority Bengali who believed in secular secularism and not religion based politics and fundamentalism. And currently, the same uh, ideological conflict goes on. So currently, the, uh, you know, it is extremely important that Bangladesh continues with these policies of uh, uh, countering fanatic, uh, you know, religion fanaticism. If you if you look at uh, 26th of March, uh, Prime Minister Modi's visit, and right after that, you've seen that um, uh, uh, there was uh, demonstrations by Islamic, uh, you know, social organizations uh, protesting his visit. And there we had to, the government had handled it with zero, zero tolerance, and it will continue to handle it like that. So there will be, there will be no place for religion-based politics in Bangladesh. There will be no re, uh, place for, uh, you know, a rise of uh, radicalization or extremism. And the policies will be uh, of, of current government, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's government, will be a zero tolerance towards that. So thank this will not tolerate it. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, thank you. And, and fascinating that uh, that the same strands that created the war on terror and all that stuff that we've been going on were there in 1971 and they are there now and Bangladesh is dealing with them in the same way uh, uh, over that vast period of time. Thank you very much. Please stay with us, High Commissioner, if you have time, because we're now going to, to MJ Akbar, uh, who's a member of the upper house of the Indian Parliament, uh, the British equivalent to the House of Lords, journalist, publisher, author of many books, and I remember very much MJ Akbar, the groundbreaking Shade of Swords, which explained the forces behind 9-11 and beyond that we were just referring to uh, in, that, in that discussion with the High Commissioner. Uh, today, MJ Akbar is going to hone in on the relationship between the two Bengals over the past 50 years. So MJ Akbar, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Humphrey. Thank you very much, the forum. Thank you very, very much, all fellow uh, panelists, and in particular, uh, the High Commissioner. Uh, thank you very much, High Commissioner, for reasserting, mentioning our Prime Minister's visit on 26 March. And I can reassure you of his deep commitment to uh, friendship with Bangladesh, is one of the stellar aspects of his uh, foreign policy. As you might uh, uh, have noticed, uh, Humphrey, I feel uh, slightly outnumbered here. And uh, uh, it's difficult after the uh, brilliant intervention by the uh, High Commissioner to do a follow-up act. But I shall nevertheless try my best. Let me begin by uh, doing something uh, slightly uh, uh, dangerous, which is uh, being candid. Uh, I think it's important on the two aspects that I shall begin because they have colored the relationship between our two countries, uh, unfortunately. The first is a canard that uh, the father of Bangladesh, uh, Sheikh uh, Mujibur Rahman, Sheikh Saab, uh, was pro-India. Sheikh Saab was pro-Bangladesh. Sheikh Saab, you know, those who know of him, we are too, we unfortunately had never had the privilege of meeting him. I was only a very, very junior uh, trainee or something when, uh, you know, he emerged in 71. But I've read his biography and anyone who has spent his life looking uh, at the future of uh, his country's nationalism, his country's Bengali nationalism, as has been said, uh, speaking about from the time that he heard Jinnah's speech in 1948, denying Bengal, the Bengali language. Anyone who has read his life would be know instinctively, intellectually, that uh, Sheikh Saab was a nationalist for his country. Equally, the second canard is that India has had some kind of neo-colonial intentions upon Bangladesh. And this is an absurdity. This is an ahistorical, uh, I'm afraid I can't, I feel like using a harsh word, uh, stupidity. India is proud of its fight against colonialism. Uh, British colonialism, and in that sense, European colonialism really took, took roots in Bengal and India. This is where it began. And it was India that together 
fought back against colonialism, ended colonialism. And after 1947, uh, European colonialism really could not uh, survive anywhere. So uh, we, in fact, value French. When we see and hear statistics about Bangladesh's prosperity, it makes us as happy as anyone in Bangladesh because economic prosperity is a beneficial to everyone in the region. Now, what did Sheikh Saab want vis-a-vis -vis India? He wanted something that had been missing for the three decades since 47. He wanted friendship. That is what India wanted, friendship. And this friendship was commemorated in the, uh, in the treaty of, I think, March 1971. And this friendship also had an immediate kind of uh, impact. It set up Joint Rivers Commission, which then did good work. It took time. And it took time. Why? What was the fundamental difference between what Sheikh Saab started and what continued to a large extent? I will not say that it continued uh, consistently, but it did continue is that basically Bangladesh reversed the what might be called Karachi's and Islamabad's policy towards India. What was what is the Pakistani policy towards India? It is based on a premise that unless every problem is solved, nothing else shall be solved. Now, this is a uh, to anyone who has even a marginal understanding of diplomacy, a non-starter, if not an absurdity. It is the kind of objective that warmongers seek to solve all problems with one instant action. Those who believe in peace and dialogue know that solutions are a step-by-step -step effort. And so, when we had the step-by-step -step effort, let's say, on one of our critical problems between the two bingos, which is a problem of water. We had a problem with water because of the desilting, uh, because of the silting of uh, Hooghly downriver, downstream, right, which led to the Faraka. Bangladesh had problems as a lower Iberian. It took a while. It was Murarji Desai who signed, I think, the first uh, agreement with Bangladesh on water sharing. And it took Sheikh Hasina and uh, Prime Minister Devagauda another more years in order to come to a decision or to an agreement on Faraka, a decision in which Jyoti Babu, uh, Jyoti Vasu, Chief Minister of West Bengal, played a very significant part, as indeed Bengal had to play in solving what would be uh, problems which involve. Uh, Graphic both this really is the process through which uh, two nations have now created uh, a very important, a very important fact uh, aspect of our relationships, and that is the peace dividend. This peace dividend has managed to solve problems that were considered uh, insoluble. Uh, all through history, one of the greatest problems that has existed between neighbors is of claims over land. And it, what could never be resolved through conflict was resolved through peace. And that was Timbaga, the, uh, which was one of the you know, outstanding problems left by uh, Cyril Latcriff. However, it was sorted out. It was sorted out, and in India, India's parliament, it was uh, supported, of course, it was the Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister uh, mm -hmm. Modi's uh, initiative, but it was supported by all political parties. Now, that is the strength of goodwill that exists for Indo-Bangladesh friendship. And this power of this uh, unanimity should never, never be uh, underestimated. Uh, the situation today, as we have heard, uh, from all uh, our speakers, uh, and I'm 
diverting just a little because it has occurred to me to ask uh, Dr. Subhan Rahman, uh, who knows, I'm sure Dr. Dr. Kissinger well, uh, that Dr. Kissinger uh, was the person who once called uh, Bangladesh, disparaged our friend Bangladesh as a basket case. You should ask Dr. Kissinger today whether he regrets it because it's a very, very full basket now. And one of the reasons for this uh, reason, of course, the most important reason is Bangladesh's own abilities, its own entrepreneurial skills, which has, as Dr. Savan said, brought along a certain uh, cascade of problems, but it is on Bangladesh's achievement. But it is also because the environment of the East has been gaining through the economic element of the peace dividend. Today, there is uh, energy from India is going to Bangladesh. Now, this again is in the, well, to use <laughs> the same uh, uh, metaphor, in the basket of uh, unimaginables. And uh, there, there is a connection on travel. Uh, let's repeat a simple fact. Today, uh, between India and Pakistan, well, let's, you know, pro-COVID, post-COVID times, uh, you can barely fill two, two flights a week. But today with Bangladesh, in normal times, when everything resumes, right, there are 10, 12 flights a day. If you go to Atari on our western border, it's a frozen. border. You know, it's a friendly border. It's a border like European border with uh, with uh, visa. And you can cross in 10 minutes, 15 minutes. People are doing it normally. This is how civilized nations and neighbors must live. And this is what we aspire to. This is the connectivities that have emerged have helped create an environment in which the whole of the eastern region is now uh, being able to look at a economic future, which is for, but it's definitely going to be possible over the next 10, 15 years. Look at the cooperation that we have seen, and this is happening uh, perhaps not in the headlines, but certainly below the headlines between the two Bengals, between Dhaka and Delhi and between the two nations, the cooperation in the struggle against terrorism. It's a very important fact because nothing can disrupt a nation as easily and as dramatically and as maliciously as terrorism. Bangladesh has some suffered badly. And exemplary an exemplary fact for our region and indeed for the world. This, uh, there is, uh, there is uh, cooperation in what is known as uh, medical uh, tourism based cooperation. Most of all, I think what keeps us together is a commitment to a common values of democracy, of secularism, of multi-faith harmony of achievement of hope to economic equity. Maybe we, nobody, no nation can achieve economic equality, but we must we have to achieve, we have to create conditions in which the poor get a far larger share of the economic pie than anyone else. Because without raising the level, eliminating poverty, we are not going to uh, achieve anything at all. The rest of the achievements will be statistically. Now, when it comes to part of uh, and, the new and, 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 okay, I'm, I'm sorry to, but your internet audio is going all over the place. So I wondered if we could, uh, it, it, if we could perhaps move on and then come back and and, and hope that uh, in the Q and A and hope that it uh, it improves because you're dropping out an awful lot at the moment. Well, I was just going to make one point and then I'll have uh, leave the screen wholly back to you. 
<laughs> okay, if, if we can okay. hear it. Yes. And that's how okay. we, having, we are having a post-tornado uh, situation here, and it's okay. raining like a monsoon. Ah, right. Uh, okay. Uh, bad side. So, you know, I, I, I don't know what. But anyway, let me just make my uh, last point that, you know, one of the things, the great differences that we have seen is that we have ended uh, the concept of Pakistan as a, you know, uh, the problems that existed with that uh, concept of a monotonous Pakistan, which was ended. But the uh, the concept of the nucleus of South Africa, I, I, I fully understand a nation's desire to be a nucleus. Uh, but we have to think now of a nucleus, not as an atom, but of a nucleus as a molecule. And a nucleus in which there is cooperation and cooperation is the basis of the way forward. Without cooperation, uh, even on the uh, on the Indo-Pacific, after all, Bengal and the Bay of Bengal are linked. The waters are linked directly uh, in the in the Indo-Pacific. It is cooperation that we seek between all nations. And cooperation for what? Cooperation for free for freedom of navigation, cooperation for freedom, cooperation to ensure that there is no domination by, on the rights of travel and the rights. And I think if we are committed to the, these principles, then the way forward actually becomes far easier than, uh, you know, uh, than just using uh, diplomacy as a set of tactical uh, approaches. Uh, we need a common strategy. We are building a common strategy. There are institutions like BIMSTEC which uh, are working forward towards it. They need far more activity, in my view, than they have at the moment. And I think uh, of Asia and of India that they bring to the table, the commitment of their vision forward is one of the healthiest aspects as we look ahead. And I think uh, if that commitment gets the right uh, environment, uh, particularly as we seek to rescue our economies from this uh, terrible havoc created by COVID, uh, it's an opportunity to actually work together and create the economy for the next generation uh, that I think uh, the leaderships and the people have dreamt of. Uh, thank you, Humphrey. Well, thank you for, for, for pioneering your way through the technology there, and uh, and thank you for an excellent uh, presentation. A couple of points that I that all the panelists I hope would, would think over that are, that are coming through. Uh, one from Sonia Sonia Khan, who who asks about increasingly bipolar in its vision and equal intolerance between secularists and Islamists on each other's views. No need for an answer right now, but uh, that'll be coming up. want to get to an answer on that. And the other one is, is to what extent could Bangladesh become a proxy or tied up in the Indo-China or, or China-US uh, situation that's developing? These are two issues that I'd like to explore during the Q&A. But before that, uh, we're going to go to David Lewis, a professor of social policy and development at the London School of Economics. Uh, and as a young anthropologist, he cut his teeth with regular field work in Bangladesh. He knows a lot about development, not just there, but also he's worked in Albania, the Philippines, Russia and Uganda, as well as across much of South Asia. So David Lewis, will you tell us how civil society and development is faring in Bangladesh? Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to the Democracy Forum for this opportunity to speak on a panel with such illustrious and experienced colleagues. Um, as Humphrey said, I've been visiting Bangladesh fairly regularly since the 1980s, but I'm speaking to you very much as an outsider. Um, and it's a great privilege uh, to be here. So I'm going to talk a little bit, um, I mean, at risk of repeating some of what's been said, but I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the achievements of Bangladesh's 50-year journey. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about some causes for concern. 
So the 50 year journey of Bangladesh, I think, is one that would impress any student of development. And despite its fragile and unlikely origins, its historic lack of geopolitical importance and the relative absence of natural resources, the country's environmental vulnerability uh, and its frequent political instability, it's made huge and I think for some people quite surprising gains um, in terms of economic development. As, as we've heard, it's recently graduated uh, to be a middle income country. In 2020, the IMF estimated that its per capita GDP had overtaken that of India. Um, and Bangladesh has become a leading garment exporter. Particularly impressive as well are its gains in the field of social development. Almost all its children now complete primary school, while only a third of them did in the 1980s. Uh, female literacy in Bangladesh is higher than India's, 72% as opposed to 66%, far better than that of Pakistan, as only 46%. Uh, Bangladesh's infant mortality has dramatically improved, also better than both Pakistan and India. And female participation in the labour force is also higher. When it comes to health, also dramatic achievements. Life expectancy was just over 46 years in 1971. It's now over 72 uh, moving away from these kind of development indicators, Bangladesh has long been taking a leading role in international climate action. And its generous response to the 2017 Rohingya crisis was one that I think we could say sets new international standards of humanitarianism. And as we heard from Professor Soban earlier, at the heart of these achievements, in addition to the government, has also been its non-governmental sector, its uh, civil society organisations, which have played a major role in these achievements alongside the government. Historically, um, we've had, for example, Zafrullah Chowdhury on essential drugs and public health, uh, Fazle Abid's organization BRAC has, or, has already been mentioned with its achievements in many areas, child health, education, many others. Uh, Muhammad Yunus with his work on microcredit and entrepreneurship uh, development and many others, many other organizations. So all of those things I think are tremendously important um, but I want to now move on to a few causes for concern around the trends within this once vibrant uh, civil society. I would argue that the first of these is that civil society has become less diverse, less innovative and radical. Fewer, fewer NGOs engaged in the kinds of activities that we once saw. In my own research um, in recent years with Abul Hussein, we've done detailed on the ground fieldwork around issues of local governance and development in three different locations in the country both in the middle of the 2000s and more recently in 2017, where we went back to the same locations. And we noticed the decline of rights-based development work by NGOs and a shrinking of local civil society space with most local institutions now strongly co-opted or controlled um, you know, by the ruling party, whether we're talking about community associations, professional groups, uh, business associations. So that's one set of problems that I think are a cause for concern. The second is the trend 
around political and human rights. And I think the, um, the fact that, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about the uh, secular traditions of independent Bangladesh, but I think it's also fair to say that the government has a patchy record of protecting um, liberal voices. So, for example, the so-called atheist bloggers, um, 11 deaths between 2013 and 18, and many of these independent thinkers fled abroad. Also, there are concerns about the 2018 Digital Security Act, which has allowed authorities to jail critical voices. A very high profile of that a couple of years ago was the renowned photographer Shahid al Alam, and there have been others. In 2020, the Asia Human Rights Commission reported that 138 people had been arrested for criticizing official corruption or criticizing the prime minister or her family. So I think there are concerns around rights. And then finally, also press freedom. There are some who, who see that in jeopardy as well. Um, there have been increasing numbers of attacks on journalists and on human rights defenders, whether those are in the form of physical attacks or threats or uh, vexatious legal cases. And actually just this week, a prominent journalist of uh, Protomalo newspaper, Rosina Islam, was, was arrested and held, um, allegedly for her investigations into uh, corruption in the Ministry of Health. So I've tried to tell an extremely positive story, but I've also tried to raise some concerns. I want to end with two points, really. The first is that the world should pay more attention to Bangladesh. There's no excuse for its continuing um, status, as, as Naomi Hussain has put it, its light imprint on the international imagination. We should know more about Bangladesh and we should, and we should take more interest in it. But I think at the same time, we should note that it's a country at quite a risky crossroads. And um, I hope very much that the idea of repression in the name of economic development is not held as a, as a way to go. Because I think that there's a risk that the uh, concerns around democracy and human rights can threaten these impressive achievements. So thank you very much. Thank you, David, very much uh, for that. And rather than go to you uh, to follow up on something, I think I'd like to go straight to the High Commissioner. Um, you're still here. Excellent. Um, it, 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 David talked about a, a regression of human rights and arrests, uh, of that sort of thing. And he also mentioned, of course, you know, is it repression in order to for economic gain? Uh, could you give us a, a, a brief response uh, to is there backtracking of human rights, um, uh, respect for human rights in Bangladesh? And if so, why? Um, thank you, um, Humphrey, very much. Uh, I was uh, very interesting comments by Professor David. And uh, also, I want to thank him for praising uh, some of the uh, positive sides of Bangladesh. I think that, you know, um, particularly in British academia, in um, civil society, uh, there needs to be a lot of decolonization of perceptions. You know, I think that UK still holds a very colonized perspective of Bangladesh. And from there, we always see that British media, you know, in South Asia, Bangladesh is the only country. Again, it gets hit, bulldozed by British media and sometimes criticized extensively by uh, British academia. But I think they need to decolonize this view and they need to understand that uh, this kind of, you know, uh, if you look at the human rights record across South Asia and developing country, you know, 
nobody is perfect. But at the end of the day, what the government is, what kind of institutions we hold, what kind of values we hold, and uh, uh, whether we have a free media, whether we have a free society, these are very important aspects. And, uh, you know, um, we, uh, we, I, I've already paid my tribute to civil society. Civil society plays a very important role, and the government and the civil society work hand in hand on social issues, on issues of, uh, you know, uh, uh, people's emancipation. So uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, microcredit on, uh, or uh, you talk about primary education, uh, even when UK aid goes to Bangladesh, you know, 10% of UK aid goes to BRAC, the largest NGO in the world. But 97% of the aid goes to civil society. 3% uh, goes to some sort of technical assistance to Bangladesh government. So, you know, I think these are things of the past. This kind of, uh, you know, um, colonized approach to thinking that Bangladesh is the only offender in, in the world uh, or in South Asia uh, needs to be changed. There needs to be decolonized, this attitude. And, uh, uh, you know, we, um, uh, you know, I went to, what I want to summarize is that, you know, in no way, uh, Bangladesh, uh, our record in human rights, uh, we are a member of the Human Rights Council, but you know everything that happens in Bangladesh, it's a free society, free media, free social media. Um, nothing is banned in Bangladesh. YouTube is open, social Facebook is open. You will never hear Bangladesh is banned these you know social media. Okay. And can, can, can I, I think there's a, a lot of perception, and definitely you know what happened in the health ministry. There's a there's been a pu uh, public statements of the health minister of the law minister that due diligence and due course of law will take place. Um, uh, uh, and in this case, uh, nobody's human rights will be violated. Okay, can, can I just uh, just uh, ask you for, for a very, has the West or has David got it wrong, David Lewis got it wrong on this? And is there an Asian values when it comes to human rights that we're beginning to see in the United Nations now being discussed? And is there a Western values? And is, is, is as I think, as David mentioned, repression needed for economic advancement. Just if you could encapsulate that thought for us, High Commissioner. Thank you. I would, you know, first of all, uh, uh, David did mention about uh, economic, uh, you know, uh, progress uh, is being used as a tool of repression, something like that. This is absolutely baseless because, you know, uh, there was no way you can ignore the leadership. Why is it that in the last one decade, Bangladesh's, Bangladesh's every single performance uh, is so, uh, you know, stunning. It is because, you know, it cannot happen in a vacuum. Uh, where the government is spending uh, budget and our GDP is growing, there's a huge investment by the government in the people. And that is... You're talking about the human rights element here. Is it necessary it's the same to thing. If human out rights record, If human rights record was so bad, then it'll come up. You know, we're a member of the Human Rights Council. There are platforms who discuss these issues, and our human rights record is no less or no more than any other South Asian country or the Asian. And yeah, there is a perception, you know, there's a difference and gap in uh, values or Western values and Asian values and the way uh, human rights is dealt with. But, you know, we have National Human Rights Commission and, uh, uh, you know, uh, the chair of the Human Rights Commission uh, is always making independent statements in Bangladesh. We have an information commission. These are independent institutions. We have a anti-corruption commission. They are, uh, you know, they're strategy bodies, they give statements and they challenge the government. Okay. Many ministers, MPs have been challenged, have been served notices, civil society, uh, civil servants have been served. So I say, I say that these are very uh, strong institutions that strengthens our democracy and our leadership and our democratic and pluralistic identity. So, uh, no, that, that, I, think, I think that's, uh, that we, we've, we've nailed that one because we have a fascinating video question uh, from Faria Masood coming at the moment on the issue of climate change. Vineet, do you have that video that we can watch? Hello to the panel. My name is Faria and I'm a journalist. I often specialise in, re in reporting on and from Bangladesh and I'm currently employed by BBC News. My question to the panel is how can we mobilise Bangladesh's leaders and its academics and also its business people to help those many thousands of Bangladeshi people who have been displaced uh, due to climate change that's often rendered their farmland unusable and how can we also mobilize Bangladeshis living abroad to help out in this issue thank you that's that's that that's one um again hi commissioner since you're on the screen with me uh has bangladesh got its own unique solution to climate change that it could uh, the, that it could tell us about uh, because you are on the front line of it again in very quickly if you could please 
Thank you, Hamre. Last year, there's this article by Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina in The Guardian and also in Financial Times. It was right after the cyclone uh, Amphan, uh, Category 5 cyclone, hit Bangladesh in the midst of COVID crisis. And, you know, uh, the article was that how Bangladesh moved 2.5 million, 2.3 million people uh, from its coastline to safety during the cyclone Amphan. This is the kind of skill and, uh, uh, you know, disaster preparedness uh, niche that we have created and skill uh, uh, by, uh, by the people of Bangladesh and the government of Bangladesh. So definitely we are a climate uh, uh, leader. And uh, we are currently the ch president of uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has assumed the presidency of Climate Vulnerable Forum, 48 most climatically vulnerable countries. When it comes to climate justice and climate displacement, already 6 million people in Bangladesh are climatically displaced. Every year due to natural disasters, the ferocity keeps on and the frequency keeps on increasing. So we are taking a leadership in climate justice on the issue of loss and damage and compensation and carbon trading. In COP26, you will see Bangladesh's uh, presidency and our prime minister uh, uh, putting forward certain proposals at the COP26 to UK presidency. And already Mr. Alex Sharma is started to visit Bangladesh and we will bring up these issues. So uh, there will be no compromise on the issue of loss and damage, uh, climate compensation, uh, uh, climate displacement and climate justice. We are also demanding a, hu a human rights council, a special rapporteur on climate change and just on human rights. Okay. Uh, that's the role of diaspora. I'd like to mention a little bit. We value our diaspora. Yeah. You know that we have uh, 10 million overseas temporary migrant workers, 10 million, including 6 million in, in, in the Gulf. And they send uh, back to Bangladesh. And that is why, you know, the S&P and the standards, our economic stability, macroeconomic stability is so strong because our remittance flows into Bangladesh. And from the UK also, our diaspora's role is extremely important and valued by Bangladesh government. And uh, the fiscal policies, uh, smart fiscal policies have helped raise, uh, you know, the record amount of remittances coming from overseas. Okay. So diaspora can play a very important role in climate partnership and cli climate prosperity partnership. I just like to end with this. Bangladesh at the COP26 is presenting this new climate prosperity plan. It's called the Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan that is coined by our prime minister. It's a, it's a plan that promotes a renewable energy, offshore renewable energy, a low carbon development path, and definitely a transition uh, to renewable energy by 2050. So I think okay. that is a very strong leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, High Commission. Now, we've, we've got a very little amount of time left, so I want to go around the rest of the panel on two questions, and I'd like you, if you can, to answer in just a couple of words. Um, is, is Bangladesh going to become a proxy in the, uh, in the Indo-Pacific? Um, and, and sum up your definition, again, in two or three words, of what nucleus means. What does it mean to be the nucleus of South Asia? Uh, so, Bom, perhaps you could start off and we'll go around to Saeed and MJ Akbar and David Lewis. Very quickly, please. May you answer, answer the second question first? I'm afraid I never quite understood what it meant to be nuclear. <laughs> and should have sought clarification on that from the beginning. Uh, but well, anyway, I mean, as, as, a proxy, as, as far a as proxy, the issue, as far as the issue of proxy is concerned, well, I don't see anyone being a proxy of anyone over here. I think uh, Bangladesh is walking a tightrope between uh, two neighbors. Uh, our Prime Minister has very sensibly declared that ideally we would prosper the most if our two neighbors in fact got on a lot better and in fact within a collaborative framework of Asian cooperation as was envisaged by Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru way back in 1946. Okay. Uh, all of Asia would be doing a lot better in Bangladesh and all the other South Asian countries would in fact be uh, looking to their future with much greater optimism. It is this emerging tension between what should really be the greatest assets of the region, having what will eventually be the world's largest economy and the world's third largest economy as your neighbors. Okay. Should in fact be our greatest asset and or, 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 be to anyone. Th thank you very much for that. Saeed, very briefly, uh, how do you see this concept of nucleus? Uh, yes, if, if you're referring to Bangladesh as, as, as a nucleus, as, as a nucleus in South Asia, uh, I think that's, that's very well put because we are economically, uh, we are advancing as, as uh, many of my uh, co-panelists have pointed out. And then again, 
uh, uh, on the global scale in, 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 in such areas as climate change, uh, we have been doing very, very well problems uh, that have to be uh, resolved. So uh, the nucleus, yes, we are the nucleus. Proxy. So I don't think uh, uh, there uh, there's any question of Bangladesh being a being a proxy, because over the last 10, 12 years, we have seen uh, the government of Bangladesh uh, uh, demonstrating or practicing a foreign policy that is is, is balanced, uh, and uh, the, the the country is uh, maintains good relations with India, and it has reached out to China. There also we have good relations, and with Russia we have good relations. The only uh, problem that we have uh, is with regard to to Myanmar or, or Burma okay. and uh, the, the refugees, the refugee situation. What the Bangladesh government would like to do because of its balanced foreign policy uh, with these three countries, Russia, India and, uh, um, and uh, China, uh, we would like these three countries to play a more proactive role in helping Bangladesh tide over the refugee, the Myanmar, the, the Rohingya refugee situation. Okay. So I think we are, we are on, 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 a, on, a, on a good road here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very concise uh, element. And NJ Akbar, could I ask you as a journalist to wrap up in 30 seconds the proxy issue, the, 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 the proxy issue for Bangladesh and how you, how you see it being a nucleus? Well, I take uh, almost as long as your question, Humphrey, which is... Uh, <laughs> the, yeah. Uh, no one is a proxy for another. We have a recent incident in which I think the Chinese ambassador in Dhaka uh, held a press conference, which is rather bizarre, uh, in order to give instructions to his host country instead of going to the ministry. And the Bangladesh government uh, reacted uh, quite uh, firmly, saying that, uh, you know, what could be said uh, better uh, should not have been said at all. I don't think Bangladesh is anyone's proxy. It's a, it's a absurd thing to actually allege. Uh, Bangladesh has uh, its own independent views on how it should go forward and uh, that is the way it will be. Uh, as far as the nucleus issue is going, I had said that in my presentation earlier, we have to see nucleus not as a single atom but as a molecule with a few atoms inside and nucleus must be an enabler of cooperation. Once a right. nucleus is an enabler of cooperation, then the nucleus aspect begins to work. But Excellent. if the nucleus is unilateral, then, uh, well, it will remain uniform. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. And a nucleus is an enabler of cooperation. That, that's brilliant. the total opposite to a nuclear weapon, uh, which, uh, which would... David, David Lewis, if you could address those points. You mentioned quite interestingly that no natural resources and geopolitically relatively irrelevant. Uh, could it become a proxy? And, and, and in what way is it a nucleus? Okay, well, uh, I guess all, all sort of relatively small countries... Uh, risk becoming proxies, but I, I don't think there's any real danger of that happening to Bangladesh because of its adeptness in playing its strategic position very effectively. So I think at the, you know, it's at the juncture of, of Southeast Asia and South Asia. It's, 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 um, it's in a position to to manage, I think, relationships between its very large neighbours. So I'm, I'm not. I think it, it remains, you know, non-aligned in that, in that sense. And I'm, I'm fairly confident about that as a future path. On the nucleus thing, I'm also slightly puzzled by the nucleus idea. But I think, I think, you know, Bangladesh is increasingly setting the pace in in South Asia in relation to many of those key issues that I mentioned. So I think rather than a nucleus, I'd, I'd rather describe it increasingly as an exemplar of, okay. you know, very important um, ideas and trends. And in fact, I'm just going to slip in a piece of publicity for another panel that I'm organizing at the LSE tomorrow afternoon on what Bangladesh can teach the world about climate change. Okay, okay. Which I hope to attract some more audience to. Oh, excellent. On oh. that exemplar theme.
<laughs> well, thank you. Exemplar uh, Nucleus, we have a, 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 a very interesting from Ajay Singh. Uh, there are no Asian values in human rights. There are universal human rights, which is very much a debate that is going on now between China and the US and all of that over the Indo-Pacific, of which we now go to Barry Gardner, the chair of the Democracy Forum, who has been listening in to us all and will join us the dots and sum up everything we've been saying. Barry, the screen is yours. Muted, I think. Uh, am I am I audible you, now? You now, Barry. So the screen and, and the audio is yours. Can I first of all say that of all the Democracy Forum events, which I have summed up over the past few years, um, I cannot recall one where I have uh, been more enlightened by the speakers and the discussion. I think this has been an absolutely first class discussion and I'm really grateful. It, I, I've learned so much. Um, Lord Bruce, of course, started by setting out the four pillars, nationalism, secularism, democracy, and socialism. A and I think what has unfolded over the past couple of hours is, is the perception that a structure on four legs is stable. Uh, a structure on three legs is less stable. And a structure on two legs actually has collapsed. Um, and Professor uh, Raymond Sowen was, was absolutely comprehensive. It was a magisterial performance, I thought, taking us from the development transformation, the entrepreneurship, uh, the quadrupling of agricultural production, um, the micro-industrial emergence, the micro-credit. Um, but he did not shirk from talking about the emerging problems. Um, he, he referenced the migrants that are coming into the cities and, and, and of course, um, the subsequent discussion uh, with Her Excellency and Faria speaking on climate change, absolutely 2.5 million people able to be evacuated uh, because of the, the uh, cyclone storm um, was, was an extraordinary occasion in May of last year. Um, but of course, there is this increasing move into the cities. Um, and that is is taking its own toll. Now, if you look at the the perspective plan that, that Bangladesh has set out for 21 to 41, uh, 2021 to 2041, this next 20 years of, of its development, um, it's very ambitious. Um, it, it's looking to achieve upper middle income status by 2030. But of course, um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says that 17% of land and 30% of agricultural food production may well be lost by 2030 as a result of climate change. So the tensions that Bangladesh is having to cope with, I, I don't think are appreciated in, in certainly in the UK and in the wider world. Clearly they are appreciated in Bangladesh, but that move, that migration from the cities is beginning to cause, I think, serious problems. And he talked about political parties motivated more by, uh, he put it so much more eloquently than I could, but but I, I captured simply political parties more motivated by financial gain than public good um, and a much less egalitarian society. And of course, Wyas Gill in, in, in the uh, commentary, in the, in the chat uh, said, how will governments curb the fanatical groups. And there's a link here, of course, because the the corruption and for all that the High Commissioner said, um, it's undeniable that, that Bangladesh ranks as 139th out of 168 uh, countries on the International Corruption Index. Um, so we see that failure of one strand of the four pillars um, and the way in which corruption uh, in the cities, the way in which it's given way to um, the uh, the sort of mafia, the, the uh, mastans, um, particularly in Dhaka, I believe, um, which are really infecting the body politic. Um, 
And so that rapid urbanization as a result of climate change, but a lack of government support for the slum dwellers, coupled with that corruption, uh, I think now paves the way for the extremism um, that was then referenced. Um, now, Saeed Badr al-Assan, um, he focused on that secularism, the importance of the secularism, and, and I thought it was a, a superb presentation of the way in which the history had unfolded, speaking of the Dark Ages, uh, and also speaking about the sanitization of history uh, to airbrush the role of Pakistan out um, and how Bengali nationalism had been the basis of liberation, but but the destruction of secularism and nationalism uh, had, had come about in 75, making the rise of Islam as a state religion, uh, again, an undermining of those four pillars. Um, Sonia Khan intervened um, in a question um, saying the challenge of the next 50 years, one, establish pr proper democratic governance, two, accountability of institutions, and three, tolerance. She feared the nation is becoming increasingly bipolar uh, with this split between Islamism and separatism, uh, and secularism rather. Um, now, Her Excellency, I, I, goodness me, Your Excellency, I'd love an ambassador like you, okay, um, because you certainly punch your weight, you certainly deliver uh, your government's message. Uh, I, I think it was a, a tour de force the way you presented things. Um, but then um, I thought we saw in David Lewis, um, we saw there an outsider, we saw an anthropologist at work. I, I once watched a crow in Kew Gardens. And the gardens had, had laid fresh turf uh, over a muddy patch where people trampling it had, uh, had got it all muddy and disgusting. And the new turf looked lovely. But what the crow did was it got its beak and it picked up the corner of the turf and pulled it back so it could get at the bugs and the beetles underneath. And I felt that actually what um, uh, what David Lewis did there was precisely that. He's an anthropologist. He, he, uh, it's his job to look dispassionately, objectively at human behavior from the outside. And of course, his view chimed very much with MJ Akbar, who spoke of economic cooperation, energy cooperation, and cooperation on extremism, um, as being fundamentally important. He spoke about the, the great achievements in education, health, women's development, climate action, uh, and microcredit. But he did highlight the concerns. And what a phrase that was when he said, the trends within this once vibrant civil society. The trends within this once vibrant civil society were the cause of concern. So, the decline of rights-based society, uh, the co-option into the political elite, uh, the human rights concerns that come from that and the patchy record of protecting independent and critical voices. Um, these are the things which are causes of great concern. But I want to focus back, Your Excellency, on what you said as, as the High Commissioner, um, when you spoke of the fourth strategic dialogue with the UK, when you spoke of the, the clear friendship that there is between the UK government and, and the Bangladeshi government, um, and the need to have partnership on digital climate skills and counterterrorism. Um, I welcome that. You were very forceful, I thought, in uh, quite correctly, when you, when you spoke about uh, COP26 and the need to talk about loss and damage uh, and to get uh, financial uh, redress. Um, I would urge you when you do that at COP26 um, and in the run up to that, to use Bangladesh's diplomatic skills and its influence with other countries to have a linkage between loss and damage and Article 6, uh, which you will know is, is all about the uh, making sure that emissions trading uh, and the, uh, there will be no double counting of emissions. This is the completion of the rule book of the UNFCCC that was supposed to take place in Paris, um, and it's now got to 
occur here uh, in Glasgow at the end of this year. So I think there are, are huge challenges ahead. Um, I think it has been one of the most fascinating democracy forums that we have ever had, uh, and I'm most grateful to have been a part of it and to have listened to such excellent speakers. Barry, thank you very much, and, and what a wide range it is, and I, I completely agree with you here to such an extent that we're going to break with tradition and uh, the tour de force of the High Commissioner uh, is coming back to give us 30 seconds of her own wrapping up on behalf of the Bangladesh government. High Commissioner. Thank you, um, uh, Humphrey. Uh, I just want to say that, you know, uh, the, your title, Nucleus, I want to thank everyone for their views. And I have full respect for Professor David Lewis's views as well. Um, uh, you know, uh, just like Mr. MJ Akbar said, you know, rather than a nucleus, we'd like to be the connectivity hub of South Asia. We'd like to be, because we are, ge uh, you know, geopolitically positioned like that. So I would rather say we are the emerging ge uh, connectivity, geoconnectivity hub of South Asia, where we're having seamless power connectivity with India. We're looking towards the similar connectivity with uh, uh, with Myanmar. We want to have a seamless, you know, uh, connectivity between Bay of Bengal and Indian Ocean Ring. So there, uh, our strategic importance needs to be highlighted and needs to be realized and reassessed by the West. Uh, this is what I want to say. Uh, instead of nucleus, we are we have a foreign policy that says very balanced. We want to have friendship with all, and I think strategically we're utilizing that foreign policy very smartly by our leadership, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. So coming back to those issues, I would like to say in climate, uh, in uh, and, uh, and one more fact: me being a woman, I would like to everyone to reflect that you know. Uh, why is it that women em empowerment and education had brought this transformation into Bangladesh? And this is, uh, uh, is part of our secular values. Again, you know, we have to, the West has to look into to ensure that the civil, you know, we, we're speaking about civil society and uh, the government of Bangladesh, uh, current government, uh, have full respect for the civil society, as well as, you know, our, our standards and human rights. Like I mentioned, we are a member of the Human Rights Council. We have full respect. We are a party to the ICCPR. And we take this thing seriously and maintain international standards. And I quite agree with somebody who made a comment that, you know, there are no Asian standards of human rights. We pursue international standards of human rights. But we also have our limitations in, in terms of how we, uh, you know, institutions of how we deliver on them. But at the same time, the political commitment and intent is very important. That is what is respected by the British government. That is how we work with the British government. Uh, and, you know, our relationship with UK, our relationship with India and other Western countries, are based, particularly with UK and India, are value-based relationship. Uh, you know, human rights, democracy, inclusion, women empowerment, progressive aspirations of mankind. These are the main fundamentals of our bilateral relations with the United Kingdom as well as with India. Therefore, we are looking towards a very prosperous, you know, a relationship in prosperity. And in, in a, in a, when, when we talk about Golden Bengal concept of Bangabundu, it's a prosperity concept, a prosperity concept that is inclusive. And every, you know, uh, in, during the COVID, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina gave the second highest financial stimulus package in Asia, which was 15 billion US dollars. And who are the target people? The marginalized people. You spoke about the slum dwellers. Everybody was given. 2,000 to 3,000 taka per month as cash incentive to survive during this difficult time. And that is why our per capita, you know, our GDP uh, uh, is con continues to be 5.2%. Behind that, there's a lot of stimulus package and government incentive. So we must not forget the importance of leadership and the role of uh, leadership in supporting free media, supporting civil society. In future Bangladesh, we continue to, you know, uh, on behalf of my government, I would like to reiterate our government's commitment and commitment to Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina to continue to play a leading role in supporting civil society in Bangladesh, free media, as well as taking leadership in climate change and being the voice of climate justice for the vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you so much for that summing up uh, of, of, uh, of being a, a balanced hub of South Asia, um, the nucleus is the, the, the possibly. Uh, now, we're moving on to our June webinar on June the 17th, uh, two o'clock the normal time, Understanding Pakistan's Overtures for Peace with India. Is China the elephant in the room? And then on July the 14th, uh, Assassination of Political Exiles from Pakistan. Has the West lost the will to protect freedom uh, to dissent? The Democracy Forum, we do not shy away uh, from the big issues. Its sister publication, Asian Affairs, has a lot of material in it from experts that you will not find in any of the mainstream press. Thank you to the panel. Thank you, High Commissioner. 
Uh, thank you, Lord Charles Bruce. Thank you, Barry Gardner, and everybody uh, for taking part in this uh, in this webinar. Uh, thank you to the team of Democracy Forum, Vinit Jury. Uh, are you there, Vinit? He's been putting us on and off screen uh, throughout uh, flawlessly. Um, thank you for that. And for all of you out there, uh, goodbye and stay safe.